Are you sure it's a concurrency issue? Yes. The bug doesn't, like, just because it shows up in a test with concurrency, like, doesn't mean it's a bug with the locking. It's just by phrase. Sometimes it fails by phrase. Uh, so my kind of two, uh, my, my first suggestion is Uh, comprehensively log the state of the system, uh, meaning that uh, it something is going wrong somewhere. Like this is in the case where it's not that something is like freezing up or panicking; it's that the wrong result is happening. So something internal to the state of the system is going wrong somewhere, and uh, you uh, will want some record of this uh, uh, in order to kind of look through it and see, okay, where does it start to go wrong? Now, in the case of something like uh, pipe race, a test that uh, I think forks 100 children, 50 reading from the pipe, 50 writing to the pipe, uh, there might be a lot of blocking. Uh, and so, in that case, it's usually best to get this uh, stuff that's printing out into a file so you can kind of look through it methodically. Uh, it's a little harder to do with Kimu. Uh, Test.py does this. Like when you run it, uh, it stores all, everything printed out in Kimu into a like lab X output file that it creates. So one option would be if there's a particular test, there's like this big, uh, to uh, adapt test.py or change test.py to just run this one test, uh, or run all of them uh, and just find uh, the output you're looking for uh, inside the other. Uh, another strategy that I have found useful in some cases. When, particularly when it's, say, unclear what is going wrong with a particular test. So taking a test like Hyper Robust, lots of different pieces to this test. Uh, the child is doing something, the parent is doing a bunch of steps, and so something is going wrong with this test, kernel panic or Bad result or something. One helpful strategy can be to make the test simpler until you find the simplest version that fails. So, for example, I might say, well, I'm going to comment out kind of everything that the parent is doing. You just have the child run and the parent just prints a pass message. Do I see the same failure? in this much simpler version of the test or not. Let's say I don't. It succeeds in here, but it, it fails on the uh, uh, on the full test. Well, what if I have the parent just do this like close and wait, but not actually read from the pipe? Does that work? All right, what if I add in the part where now the parent reads from the pipe, and now it fails? Okay, now I know that it's something about the parent reading from the pipe that is the cause of this. And in particular, if the parent reads from the pipe 
maybe before the child exits or after the child exits and has closed the read end. So what I'm getting at is you can change the tests and getting to a simpler test case might simplify this looking at the state uh, uh, and also might help identify the particular scenario where something is going on. Um, and to uh, what I mean by comprehensive state here uh, is you might log the like uh, kind of for each uh, using the the variables of that bounded buffer code, we might print want to print. Uh, the front, kind of the index where the front of the queue, uh, front of the buffer is. So the index where the first read is going to happen, the index where the first write is going to happen. Uh, and the contents of the array. Now, in the full implementation, you're told to use an array of 512 bytes. Uh, this is just sort of a, a, a guideline. There's nothing about the pipe that should break if you make this bigger or smaller. It should work with any size. So particularly if you're looking at this printout and printing out all 512 bytes is way too much, you can make the array smaller temporarily to get more clarity on, on what's being printed out. Questions on these debugging strategies or other questions about the layout? All right. So today is moving from uh, thinking about virtualizing the CPU, which say we had some number of CPUs, but then we had multiple processes or multiple threads that all had the illusion that they had their own CPU as they were running, and underneath the operating system was providing this virtualization, of deciding which processes or threads are running when, so that the user applications didn't have to uh, know anything about the operating system scheduler, that this was transparent to the user. And in addition to virtualizing the CPU, we're also going to want to virtualize memory. We want the operating system and the hardware to provide nice, clean, convenient illusions to uh, processes running uh, on our system in terms of what's going on with memory. So heading to this point, we're going to kind of rewind and talk about caches and the memory hierarchy. If this is going to be sort of foundational to how do we actually virtualize memory, well we need to know how memory is actually arranged on our system. And when we get to talking about how do we make this process of virtualizing memory efficient, a big part of that is going to involve the use of caches. So let's talk about what is a cache? Uh, it's like a memory that's closer to, uh, it's in between the register and the uh, rest of uh, the memory. Yeah, so this is, uh, and, and what is the benefit of being kind of closer to uh, the CPU? Faster speed, so retrieval times are shorter. So it's, it's faster, uh, and is a cat, if there's some data in a cache, is that the only copy? Of the no, data? It's, it's pulled from memory, so it's like a copy of it. 
Yeah, a, a faster... <laughs> A cache is going to hold a copy of data stored in, in memory, let's say, or some uh, uh, portion of our system that's slower to access caches. A copy of it that's in some place that is faster to access. If uh, we get a cache hit, when we, when we go to look up some data and we look in a cache and we get a cache hit, what does that mean? It means we found it in the cache. Exactly. We found our data in the cache, we would say the data is resident in the cache. Currently, currently there's a copy hanging out there. If we don't find it, what do we call that? Yes. Yeah, cache miss. That's when we didn't find it. Uh, what do we do when a cache miss occurs? Is it like the next cache or the next set of hierarchy for Yeah, we continue searching for it because we want to load the missing data that we didn't find, we want to get that into the cache. And so this may involve looking in the kind of next level of uh, our system's memory. Uh, <coughs> when we load missing data into the cache, uh, what's something we might have to do to facilitate that? We have to overwrite older data. Exactly. If our cache is full, loading our missing data in is going to mean overwriting, or as it's also called, evicting some old data in currently in the cache. Let's say we uh, are looking for a particular integer, some integer uh, at index 22 in some array. When we go looking for that in the cache. Uh, when we load the missing data in the cache, would we load just that integer? Okay. Yeah, we're going to the kind of unit of storage that we are uh, kind of loading into a cache are going to be these chunks called cache blocks. Their size is going to vary depending on the cache. Larger caches tend to have larger cache blocks. Smaller caches, smaller cache blocks. Questions so far? So familiar, I hope. Is that are cache blocks significantly smaller than uh, page size? Uh, it's a good question. Um, remind us what, what a page is. Um, it's the unit of storage within the memory. Yeah, when we're dealing with virtual memory, we won't get to this until uh, oh, uh, we'll kind of just jumping ahead to, to Friday uh, when we'll get into paging. But a page is this unit of virtual memory uh, that when managing that, we'll think of things in, in terms of pages. Uh, and typically, 
are the size of these pages will be kind of fixed uh, across the system. Always use the same size. Uh, cache blocks will, will vary. Uh, and so uh, certainly for smaller caches, pages will be much bigger. For uh, much larger caches, it might actually be pretty similar to a page. And we'll, we'll talk about a couple of examples of real world cache structures and get a sense of the size of these things. Other questions? So you know, our, our motivation for caches is performance. We want faster access to data. But we have some prerequisites for this faster access to actually you know, to, for, for, to deliver on this promise of faster access. Uh, does anyone uh, have a suggestion for kind of a property of code uh, that is necessary for, for caching to help staff? Consistency? Consistency? I'm not sure if that's uh, I, I consistency. Oh, consistency. What do you mean by consistency? Uh, you have to be consistent what there is in the cache block and what there is in memory. No. Uh, are you talking about that? Uh, that that a that a cache block uh, uh, needs to have the same data in it every time. Oh no no no. Excuse me. I don't remember in control you mentioned that like if the memory address are closer to each other, then the caching becomes much easier. Yeah, so we have a cache block. It's we access into index twenty-two, and this cache block probably contains the next integer and the previous integer and more besides out of that array. Arrow? <clears throat> we kind of need to use the scale in the other blocks. Let's do something that we're using right now. Yeah, if we do all the work of putting something into the cache and then never reference it again, that was completely wasted work. We never get the benefit of this faster access. So if we reuse the same data uh, again and again, We call that temporal locality. Right? Within a certain period of time, we use this same data over and over. Locality being this larger idea that data that is nearby, the same, uh, in this case, is what's going to make having something in a cache uh, uh, better. Also talked about. Using nearby data, like going through the elements of the array, the first access to it, to the first element of the array, we bring in a catch block that probably contains the next n elements. So then we have a catch miss followed by a whole bunch of catch hits. It's exactly what we want to see. And that's spatial locality. Okay. Accessing data that's nearby. Uh, in memory is going to lead to good cache performance. Does this make sense? Questions on locality? Alright, so let's think of how caches are actually going to behave. So when we read from a cache, uh, 
an address comes in. Here's our cache. We check is the address we're looking for present in the cache. If not, we want to go fetch it. We want to go look for it in the next uh, uh, level down. If yes, the value is in our cache, and we just want to send it back to whoever asked for it. This kind of this logic, this process here. It is implemented in the hardware. So the actual cache itself has uh, the embedded logic to take an address, check if it's there, and take the appropriate action. Uh, since it's implemented in the hardware, is there like a workaround if you know that you're only going to access this one thing once and like it's not worth the time and effort to cache it? It's uh, an interesting question. Um, that would uh, depend on hardware support. So you would both need a uh, CPU that supported an instruction that was not just fetch this data for me, but fetch this data and don't cache it. Uh, and then you would need caches that also supported an alternate pathway that when it's not in the cache, it just it doesn't try and, and load it back in. So you would there's many kind of many separate components of the system we need to uh, change to support that use case. Um, that is, uh, I think that that use case is rare enough that. Uh, at least in general purpose systems, it's hard to imagine that that added complexity would be worth kind of supporting that probably minor optimization. But yeah, that is something you would certainly do in, in theory. Other questions? All right, let's talk about a cache write. So, the picture gets a little more complicated. We're going to want to store a value at some address. And this is typically, there's going to be Some sort of write buffer that our value goes into kind of immediately when the write executes, and then uh, values will be taken out of there to actually be written into the into the cache. Again, our cache is going to ask, okay, is this address in the cache? If it's not, we need to go fetch that address into the cache and update the value. Uh, if it is, we get a cache hit. We have two different uh, types of caches that uh, do different things at this point. So we have write through caches. And write back caches. I write through. I write through. When we find the thing we're writing in the cache, we update it and then immediately 
send that change on to the next level of, of memory. Right back. We only write changes uh, that have been made to the cache uh, when the block that was changed is actually evicted. So you can imagine we have some variable uh, and it's uh, a counter that is being raised and, and lowered many, many times. And we might want to say, okay, it's fine to like add one a thousand times and subtract one a thousand times from this. And we don't need to send each of those changes sort of all the way to main memory. They can just live in the cache. And if once we're done with that data, then we make sure that it, it exists in, in main memory. Does that make sense? Yeah, so we'll typically ca uh, caches will often be right back because that uh, makes writes more efficient, um, but uh, there are some cases, particularly the cache, uh, if we expect the cache to be very volatile, if we're having lots of uh, evictions, uh, we might get more consistent performance if we're writing through. All right, questions? Uh, how, uh, I, I know we mentioned this in computer systems, but I can't quite remember. Uh, do we, how, what is the division of caches to threads to processes? Like, which, which, what, are, do threads have shared caches? Do processes have shared caches? Like, what, what, which is shared, what's not? Yeah, good, good question. How does our kind of process, cache, uh, process, threads, kernel, all this stuff relate to, to caches? Uh, if you remember our kind of memory pyramid from 208, uh, we had our CPU registers at the top and something like disk at the bottom. And from the program's perspective, so from the perspective of a thread of a process of the kernel, blah, 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 It was just memory. You access a memory address, you, you read a memory address, you write a memory address, uh, and the programs know nothing about the fact that you know this is actually divided up into uh, caches and main memory. This is completely transparent, invisible to, to the program, uh, except insofar as a good locality, appropriate use of caches in terms of how a program accesses memory can have a tremendous impact on performance. So this is transparent, except it can really matter for how efficient a program is. Other questions? All right, let's look at some Actual cache architecture. In fact, this is a familiar uh, image to, to many of you. This is the uh, structure of the Intel Core i7, where we have four cores, uh, 0 through 3. And each CPU has its own registers, has its uh, kind of level 1 caches separate into a cache for data and a cache for instructions. And we have to fetch each instruction from memory, particularly if we're in a loop and executing the same instructions over and over. Very useful to have them in a cache uh, and have them not getting evicted by data that we're, we're bringing in. Uh, and then there is an L2 cache that each CPU has uh, that has both data and instructions in it. And then all four cores share an L3 cache. 
that have put some, some numbers to these uh, are L1 cache, uh, depending on the model of the uh, i7, is 32 or 48 kilobytes, so 32 or, or 48,000 bytes roughly. The L2 caches range from 256 kilobytes to 2 megabytes, again, depending on the specific model. And there's one L3 cache anywhere from 4 to 24 megabytes. So it's in this L3 cache uh, that are the blocks in this cache might be uh, on the order of kilobytes. Jim? So on a large system, so for example, a system with 50 CPUs, so do they have shared cache? So is it really? Uh, yeah, so uh, as we add more CPUs, this hierarchy uh, uh, I think w would stay fairly similar. Uh, so, for example, uh, taking the uh, newer Apple M1 chip, the M1 has a division of four high performance cores and four energy efficient cores. And they say the energy efficient cores use one tenth of the power of the high performance cores, but of course they're, they're slower, uh, so that you can do sort of battery use optimizations. Uh, the M1 Pro and M1 Max have a different balance, eight high performance to energy efficient. This design has very large L1 caches. So you remember the Intel i7 had 32 or 48 kilobytes. Uh, it's like 192 kilobyte instruction cache, 128 gigabyte cache for our, our high performance cores. Uh, the L2 uh, cache is also quite large, though of course this is across eight or ten cores, uh, not just four. Uh, and then the M1's design is you also have like uh, a graphics processing unit and a neural network processing unit and other components on the same chip, that's their kind of system on a chip. And this entire thing, uh, it's equivalent of the L3 cache, is kind of a 16 megabyte. Yeah, Isn't it like, like Apple has like each one like one private cache? So like one level of private cache. Whereas Intel has like two levels of one and two. That's right, yes. Uh, uh, though, in, in this case, the kind of L2 caches are split between one for the energy efficient and one for the high performance. So, uh, yeah, lots of, it's a, it's a pretty wide design space in terms of how, how you bring caches. Right. Uh, this may or may not be directly related, but um, I know in a lot of modern CPUs, you'll see like hyper threading, I think is what they call it, where you've got like, you know, four cores, but eight threads can run at the same time. Uh, how exactly does all of that work in general, I guess, and specifically with caching, how does that work? Uh, I have not looked into the details of hyper threading, so that would be interesting. Let me let me get back to that because I, I know that it exists, but I can't tell you anything about what you just told me. Other questions? All right, so here is a kind of table of our memory hierarchy, where things that the top of the hierarchy are smaller, faster, and more expensive per byte. And as we go down the hierarchy, things get bigger, slower, and cheaper per byte. So we have our L1, L2, and L3 caches. Uh, these sizes are kind of ballpark. Uh, uh, what you would uh, expect for those. Uh, the level one cache kind of uh, one has to have one processor tick, basically, and get something uh, out, of, uh, out of the cache, and the time it takes to execute just a single instruction. Uh, still just a handful of instructions to get stuff out of these other caches that are right on the CPU. Uh, going to main memory, 100 times, 10 to 100 times slower than accessing caches, but you know, much, much bigger on the order of 10 gigabytes rather than a few megabytes. When you're in a data center, so you have a whole bunch of uh, machines all in racks in a, in a data center, uh, accessing over the network the main memory of another machine is going to be much faster than accessing your own local disk. Uh, 
Uh, this is called cooperative caching. And so even though a single machine might just have 10 gigabytes of memory, across an entire data center, you might have 100 terabytes of memory across all the machines there. And so they'll use each other's memory uh, as part of the memory hierarchy. This is 1,000 times slower than accessing your own memory. Uh, but uh, still uh, 10,000 times faster than accessing your own local disk. And uh, 100 terabytes of this data center memory versus just like one terabyte for your local disk. But your local disk is really not. Uh, uh, you, you want to avoid having to, to go to that as much as possible. But again, through accessing things over the network, if you pool all the data center disks together, you have something like 100 petabytes. And the access to the disk takes so much longer than the network. And the network bandwidth, the number of bytes you can transmit per second, is more than how much you can read or write from the disk per second. And so you can just access everyone in the data center disk like it's your own disk. Uh, and this gives you just an enormous amount of, of storage capacity. Uh, and if you're accessing data over the wide area network, super slow, but uh, effectively kind of unlimited storage. Uh, if you're not limited to just what you can fit in one building and have it not catch on fire. <laughs> Questions on that? Uh, yeah, this would be one memory access. Uh, uh, yeah, which a single memory access would be, yeah, looking for eight, something like eight bytes. Um, uh, so, like, I want to read like a gigabyte from local disk. Is that like that times? Of like a million, or is it like? Uh, not so. Uh, like there is uh, a time uh, in kind of overhead involved in the whole pathway of, of the request and, and the lookup. So assuming this gigabyte is a contiguous region of the disk and it can just start reading. Uh, Particularly uh, old kind of spinning platter hard drives were better at sequential access. Uh, newer solid state drives have, have good random access. Um, so I don't think it would just be this times uh, a thousand. Uh, you get some savings from you just kind of have to do one round, you do kind of one trip down to this, tell it to start the read, and then go back. But the time to do the read would, I guess, swamp everything. What is the local non-volatile bandwidth? Is it based on bandwidth? Uh, so this uh, 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 main memory is volatile. Yeah. And it doesn't have electricity, it's going to lose uh, uh, lose the data. Uh, DRAM also, uh, the state uh, decays over time, so you have to refresh. It's like go through every byte and refresh it uh, at some interval. Uh, so local non-volatile memory is, um, there are uh, kind of technologies that exist but aren't in wide use yet that are that are basically a, a non-volatile version of DRAM. So they're one that, that maintains state without an electric, electric current uh, and can accommodate kind of much in, in terms of, uh, I guess, the, uh, how big a thing you need to get, say, 100 gigabytes. Uh, it's, it's doable with this non-volatile memory, but Currently, very expensive uh, because the technology is very new. Is that kind of how SSDs work? Using transistors that can store the charge? Yeah, so, so SSD would be, uh, I think SSD would sit between this non volatile memory and the disk. Like, it's, uh, uh, like an SSD is not, um, yeah, I guess this might actually be 
an SSD that's comparable to this sort of data center memory, uh, but is but is much slower than than your own local main memory. All right. Uh, so uh, I have a question for you all to ponder. When do caches work and when they don't? Uh, when, when do they not work? So uh, things to think about uh, for this would be cache size. So we think of cache size compared to how the cache is being used. How would that affect when they work and when they might be less useful? And also think about events that would impact cash performance. And what I mean here is Events that would cause more cache misses. We have something that happens that then causes a bunch of cache misses. Uh, that's going to be uh, something we need to uh, watch out for in terms of things that, that could dramatically affect the performance of the system. So, brainstorm with your neighbors, kind of focusing on these two things. When would caches work and when might they not work? Uh, a, hearing lots of good discussion. Uh, thoughts that came up about when patches might work well or, or not. Something happened to that was like if the machine was like turned on and off. Something like I see like a few systems like one point dedicated to like one important task that happens every two hours. You might want that like CPU to like be off to that side of the time. Turn for a minute and do stuff. And if those are caches, those are disappeared. So I feel like not. Uh, yeah. So if we have some sort of occasionally running thing, uh, that's it's going to be hard for that. Maybe to, to take advantage of, of caches as much as we might like because uh, there's not necessarily a good way to preserve the state of, of caches kind of between these occasions. Well, that's fine. Okay. So, if you have a limited number of cores when you are doing a lot of processes, I think properly. Yeah, so that's a really uh, a really good point about an event that could affect our cache performance. Anyone remember what it's called when we switch from one process to another? Context switch. Uh, exactly, and if uh, I actually have a, a diagram of what that might look like, Let's say time is, is along the x-axis here, and we're tracking the, the hit rate of some particular cache. Some event, like a context switch, some sort of change in what the CPU is doing. Now all the addresses that this new process running is accessing are not in the cache, because the cache was full of data from the previously running process. Uh, and so we might see a big drop in the hit rate slash spike in cache misses before we sort of fetch a bunch of new data uh, into the cache. Hey. Um, I just have a quick question. So can a program specify what they want in the cache? Uh, 
like in an application, say I want I want to watch a game. This game thinks, oh, I'm going to have this in the memory most of the time, so I want this and this and this in the cache all the time. So that's a good question. Uh, can a program directly control what's in a cache? Uh, there are not CPU instructions that can be executed that uh, specify, I want this data in this specific cache. But every time a program accesses data, we know that that's going to cause it to be loaded into the cache. So uh, this has two parts. One, we want good locality. We want, if we are using some piece of data, we want to kind of try and do all of our work with that data, like in a in, uh, kind of in the same period of time, so that we don't don't have to keep like kicking this thing out of the cache and then bringing it back in when we need it later. Uh, and if the performance of this really matters, and this is often the case for uh, uh, games where they want to get the best performance and have really fancy graphics and, and whatnot, then you have to program it. You have to program it in a cache-aware way. Meaning, okay, I have this struct. I have to think about how big is this struct, how many of them will fit in a particular cache. I don't want to be working with more of them that fit in a particular cache at a time, because then I'm going to have really bad cache performance. I think what I was trying to ask is that um, when you start replacing data that's on the cache already, is there a way to like, prioritize some of data that you think matters more than the other? Uh, that is logic that's implemented in the cache and hardware, and so no, you have no control over that. Uh, other thoughts on cache size, events, cache performance? Okay. Uh, I was just thinking that if you have like the cache of like 10 blocks you could fit it, and you're accessing like 11 distinct regions of memory sequentially, then you can get to a situation where you're always kicking out the thing that you least recently used, which would be the thing you're going to use next. So you get, get to a situation where you're always missing based on the behavior of your program. Exactly. Uh, I have a, an example of this. Uh, for some theoretical program, uh, we see what is the hit rate using a cache of various sizes. So we can see when the cache is small, we're in exactly the situation Nathan is talking about. Every time we access something, uh, the cache is so small that it's been evicted from the cache since the last time we accessed it. And so every, every access kind of evicts something we're going to need later because the cache isn't big enough. Uh, this is called thrashing, uh, and it comes from the fact that uh, in the days when, uh, in early computing, when, say, uh, a memory was the size of a washing machine, when you had this behavior of constantly like loading new things and kicking things out, the memory would physically shake and like cause the, the, the machine to thrash around, which is where <laughs> the name of this, like, you could tell when there was bad locality or the cache was big enough because the machine would be, would be shaking. Uh, this idea of like how many cache blocks does a particular program need at a given time, uh, that is called the working set. So for some section of the program, we look at what are what is all the memory that the data that this pro this section works with. That is the working set, and if all of that fits in the cache, life is going to be great. So that's what I was getting at with you know, we have a struct. We want to make sure our working set of these structs is something that fits in the cache because then we're going to get lots of cache hits and memory access will be faster. Sarah? Are there any disadvantages of having like, huge uh, cache sizes? Uh, there are two constraints here that I can think of. Uh, one is just physical space. Like if we're putting these caches on our Intel Core i7. There's like a physical limit to how much, how many transistors we can shove in there. Uh, and then the second is cost. So our caches are going to be the kind of most expensive per byte of any memory. And so, sure, we might be able to make caches bigger, but that's going to make 
that, that's much more uh, expensive than uh, making like main memory bigger. Uh, and there may be for certain kinds of caches, there may be a, because this sort of logic is implemented in hardware, there may be some you may hit some difficulties if you're trying to make the cache too big and kind of having it sort of perform this lookup operation. Other questions? Imagine. For the Intel core, we had that unified cache that multiple CPUs were using. Does that result in the CPUs kind of like fighting over space in the cache? Uh, it certainly could, yeah. Um, if, the, if we have a shared cache, now we're thinking about the shared working set uh, among all the CPUs. Now hopefully, uh, the working set fits in one of the CPU's own caches, and so it's not having to go all the way to this unified cache very often. Um, but yeah, with uh, with uh, with a certain set of like running programs, yes, you could get thrashing in one of these shared caches. All right, so. We'll take a break and talk about our 20th president, James A. Garfield. Uh, uh, Garfield was uh, an alumna, uh, uh, an alum of uh, my alma mater, Williams College. Uh, so uh, uh, less less obscure, uh, maybe to me than to literally everyone else. Um, so. Uh, elected as a, as a Republican um, after uh, 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 Rutherford Hayes uh, uh, did uh, get the renomination after his one term. Uh, and uh, Garfield was something of a, a, a reformer um, at kind of how uh, federal government jobs were awarded uh, in this period was something called the spoils system, meaning the Republican Party wins the election. So a bunch of people that are members of the Republican Party or helped the Republican Party win are given like post office jobs, ambassadorships, uh, kind of all these different uh, appointed positions. And as you can imagine, this did not lead to the most qualified people holding these positions. It led to political cronies holding these positions. So uh, both Grant and Hayes and now Garfield are working on this kind of civil service reform. Maybe we should try and get people with some qualifications uh, into these jobs. Um, and uh, there was a uh, fairly delusional man named uh, Charles Guiteau, who uh, had had some minor involvement in the presidential campaign. But in his mind, he was the key person in getting Garfield elected. And he asked uh, the administration to be ambassador to Paris or ambassador to Vienna, and they just ignored it. <laughs> uh, and he decided that he needed to assassinate Garfield um, because he, like, he should not be ignored. Uh, and so Garfield, after uh, six months in office, is killed at a train station by Charles James Hill. Uh, there's some debate of whether it was the bullet wound or the doctors, like, working with unsanitary, like, hand washing was not a thing in medicine. Um, People sort of, this is beginning to be understood, but wasn't well understood. Uh, and so whether it was like an infection from what the doctors did or the actual bulletin that killed Garfield, there's debate about that. But uh, his uh, vice president, Chester A. Arthur, uh, will be uh, who we talk about next time as he takes over. All right. So this is our kind of. Uh, look through our, our memory hierarchy. And what are these different parts of memory that we're thinking about? Uh, so let's uh, kind of look at maybe the, the simplest version of virtual memory uh, that, that we could implement.
So when we're talking about virtual memory, uh, as you may remember, uh, what we're one major component of that is that When some program uh, accesses a memory address, what kind of memory address is that? Like a virtual memory? Yeah, so this would be a virtual address. So our applications all get this uniform picture of memory, their private virtual address space going from address zero up to uh, uh, maximum possible address, and they're the only ones using this, uh, but these addresses are fake. Uh, and that when a program accesses our virtual address, we need to have some process to translate it into a physical address so we know where the actual byte in our physical memory is located. So why would we want to do this sort of uh, uh, translation? Why would we kind of put this uh, uh, indirection or, or layer between the, the memory that a program thinks it's using in the actual memory. One would be memory protection. So if this, uh, if we don't let programs work directly with physical addresses and instead have uh, the OS or the hardware in between, we can prevent programs from doing all sorts of mischief, from, say, accessing memory they're not supposed to. If programs were working directly with physical addresses, they could just go access whatever physical address um, without someone uh, sort of uh, refereeing that. That said, we don't want to rule out the ability of processes to share memory. So we want some translation that will make it possible through uh, not uh, through some particular API for programs virtual addresses to end up translating to the same physical address. So. This would have application to shared libraries. So for example, the code to printf. If we have 100 programs running, we don't need 100 of copies of the code to printf sitting in physical memory. We'd really like just to have one and to have this translation process lead all the programs to reference the same copy of, of some chunk of code. Interprocess communication can also be facilitated by processes sharing some chunk of memory. But I might have to duck out of it. Sparse addresses is an interesting one. Uh, you probably remember that uh, in a process of memory, we have a stack, we have a heap. And these can grow and shrink. And because they can grow and shrink, we like the ability to put them far away from each other uh, in virtual memory, so that the stack can grow to, a, to encompass a, a kind of very large range of virtual addresses on a heap, and similarly grow to accomplish a very, uh, encompass a very large range of virtual addresses. Uh, but we don't want the constraint that this whole range of stuff has to be contiguous in physical memory. And so by having this translation, uh, 
we might be able to set up a situation where the user has some giant heap in its virtual memory. And then different chunks of this get mapped to different chunks of physical memory. So the user thinks, oh, I just have this giant heap that's all contiguous and nice, and it can grow. But as it grows, this translation process is going to give us a lot of flexibility in terms of where physical memory is. And so sparse addresses refer to the fact that we can just use these kind of parts of the virtual address space that are very far away from each other. Even if, say, the distance between them is much bigger than our physical memory. Because we can just locate them kind of anywhere we want within the actual physical memory. There's going to be some efficiency benefits to uh, kind of some optimizations we can do uh, with uh, virtual memory that we'll kind of get into uh, over the next few few classes. And the last major goal here is we want something that doesn't depend on the specific hardware configuration of some system. So I want to be able to take my program that ran on my computer with 4 gigabytes of memory and run it on a computer with 16 gigabytes and a computer with 2 gigabytes uh, and have that all just kind of work seamlessly. And this translation process can make it so that uh, the code for a particular program doesn't have to know anything about the physical, isn't going to assume anything about the physical memory, that it's just working with virtual. Questions on? Any goals? So, our first uh, our first attempt at um, uh, at a, a virtual memory, uh, we might have something like uh, what's called a Base and bound approach. So CPU wants to fetch uh, some virtual address, and we're just going to add this to a number stored in a base register. And that's going to give us our physical address. And so this means that we'll just have some region of physical memory that runs from the base up to the base plus some bound. And this is a region. that is reserved for a particular process. And so we'll take whatever virtual address the program is using and say it's offset by some base into this region. And uh, I guess I'll move down up here so, so that higher addresses are at the top. And when this uh, virtual address is used, we also need to check uh, 
whether it's within this particular bound. And if it exceeds our bound, it would outside this region, then we just say this is a we raise a processor exception. This is an illegal memory access. So this is this very simple scheme implemented entirely in hardware, where for each running process we just have these two special registers. Where does the their region of physical memory start? Where does it end? And it makes kind of these just two two steps to take a virtual address and check that it's a valid physical address. So this is very simple. It's fast. It gives us our, our memory protection. The process can only access physical memory that it's supposed to, that it has control over and nothing outside of it. Uh, unfortunately, we can't relocate this physical memory if we want to because we're stuck with a particular starting point. Um, sorry, we, we, we can change, sorry, the, the opposite of that. We can change this base in order to relocate the memory. So we get some flexibility that way. Uh, we can't enforce any sort of protections within this region. So typically, we don't want programs to be able to modify their own code while they're running. Uh, the, uh, a useful security feature, among other things. This won't let us prevent that. Like, if a program is doing something within its region, it can do whatever it wants. Um, and as far as memory sharing and sparse addresses go, this gives us no way for process to share memory. And give us gives us no way to have a region that can grow and shrink. You sort of commit to okay, there's this fixed region of physical memory that goes with the process. So, while simple and fast, this basic hardware approach isn't going to accomplish our goals. So next time uh, we'll talk about uh, splitting memory into segments and then into pages, and we'll be on our way to uh, actual fission virtual memory. Uh, that will do it for today. Uh, I have lab hours uh, tomorrow night uh, in Olin, and I'll see you on Friday. Papa Doom Baum, I said, nobody knows just how it started. Somebody blew it through.